All right, so we are in our Bible study time, and we are in this lesson on trustworthiness. Okay, so tr trustworthiness lesson two. <clears throat> and so we, this, this last lesson and th the lesson today, we're working on definitions. And so uh, what I want to do then is, we're going to, the first section is a review s section. And so we had a slide called What Makes Up <coughs> Saving Faith. And I had, uh, I had copied this chart, or I made this chart, so the components of biblical faith. We had these uh, three components, knowledge, assent, and trust. Okay, so we noted one can have knowledge without assent or trust. You, know, you can know what the Bible says. You may not agree with it. You may not trust it. And then you can have assent. One can have assent without correct knowledge or personal trust. You could agree with something that's false, Maybe you're not even relying on it, but you just agree with it, okay? So that's one thing. Uh, and one can have trust without correct knowledge or complete assent. Some people, uh, I, I can't imagine this, but some people just go along and whatever people say, oh yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll rely on that. And sometimes it's not so good. All right, so that is where we were. But I thought we were <coughs> talking about this and... Um, uh, there is, uh, <clears throat> uh, there are a couple of things I want to bring to your attention to help clarify what we're trying to say here. So first of all, in Dr. Talbert's book, there are three terms, three Latin terms that are given for these three categories. For knowledge, the Latin is notitia, notitia. So we can see, you can get the word note, notation, that comes from this Latin root. All right, so notitia. Now, uh, a census is the, we get a cent from a census. All right, so, uh, and then the trust is uh, fiducia. Fiducia, actually, is how they'd say that in Latin. Fiducia, okay. So, th those terms help me a little bit with understanding. I, I'm, I'm a little, in, in getting th through this section, I felt like we were sort of not, uh, really grasping what, what I was trying to communicate. And I was thinking about it, and Rob and I were talking about it actually last Sunday. And so, uh, especially the first one, uh, we came up with, with this idea here. Understanding. I like, I, I'm playing with sound effects for this one. <laughs> Understanding, that's the typewriter sound effect. Isn't that nice? Uh, it freaks you out. It's going to keep, it's going to do it three times, so just, just relax. Next one is... Agreement. Okay? So instead of saying assent, agreement. Understanding. So you're understanding the facts, noting the facts, knowledge. All right? That's the whole, that's part of you know, saving faith. You have to understand what you're reading. Remember the uh, Ethiopian eunuch said to Philip, uh, or Philip said to the Ethiopian eunuch, Understand this? Thou readest. That's the King James. Do you understand what you're reading? And uh, how can I unless somebody explain them? So when we. When we give the gospel, they need to understand what we're talking about. Then is agreement, all right? You, and, uh, and, uh, and then comes reliance or trust. Now, trust is, I think, was a li I think we could understand that, but reliance is another synonym which helps us <clears throat> to understand these terms. Now, I also, um, uh, let's see, what else was I going to say about this? Um, I was thinking about this, uh, trying to come up with contemporary examples of people who don't have all three. They are religious, but they don't have all three. And I was thinking about the Jehovah's Witnesses. They have reliance. They have trust. They're trusting something. They agree with what they're trusting, but they don't have correct knowledge. They're, they don't believe that Jesus is God. Well, they, that's not saving faith. They're sincere. They're, you know, they're fully in agreement with what they believe, but they don't believe the right thing. And, and so there's, and I was trying to come up with some others that would illustrate somebody who has, who has knowledge, but doesn't have, uh, you know, doesn't have agreement or reliance or whatever. And, and you could probably, as you think about people, you can, uh, in various uh, religious groups that aren't quite orthodox, you could probably find people who have uh, a certain amount of, understanding of the truth, but they don't agree with it, or they don't rely on it. Okay, so, 
And we had that illustration about the plow. How is a field tilled? By the farmer, the plow, or the horse? And the, you know, it's not just by the farmer by himself. He has to have the plow and the horse. Uh, he, he can't just send the horse out there, say, go plow that field, and go have a coffee, because you know, he can even hitch the horse up to the plow. He's got to drive the horse and the plow in order for the field to be plowed. And this is the same with saving faith. You need to have all three of these things working together in order to really have saving faith. Now, <clears throat> the last thing I want to add here is the, the, this addresses three components of personality. So mind, so understanding and knowledge, that is where the mind grasps what is being said. And then the will, the will has to agree that this is true. And, and then there is an emotional component here in trust. Uh, and so that brings, gives us confidence and it affects our behavior. How do we, often do we say, how do, how do we know somebody has really been born again? Well, they start living in accordance with the scriptural principles. Somebody come to me and say, you know, I, I've noticed that the Bible says this, thus and so, and you know, I haven't lived that way. Well, then you, you need to change. And if they have believed in the Lord, and they want to follow the Lord and please the Lord, they change. Sometimes the change is automatic. They don't even do it without, they do it without even, uh, you know, reading in the Bible. They just know, I've got to change that area of my life. I've got to make an adjustment. And so there is a, uh, the mind, well, and emotions are all involved in this saving faith uh, and uh, in bringing us to Christ and so forth. All right, any questions or comments on what I talked about just now? Okay, so let's move on. We're still a little bit of review. The next one is the state of faith. Um, uh, let's see, I guess I put a couple of things here. I don't, I guess I've covered this. Let me just see, let me just look at my notes here so I know what I'm talking about. Okay, so our first application of this is to saving faith. A new believer understands the gospel message, comes to agree with it, commits himself to it, he depends on it to save him from his sins. This produces a confidence of salvation and changed behavior in his life. And then the second application is sanctifying faith. Any believer, okay, so I do want to add this. Any believer understands a new concept or passage of scripture, comes to agree with it, commits himself to applying it. This produces confidence in the Christian walk and often a changed behavior pattern in some area of life. You know, <clears throat> there, this process of uh, deepening our faith goes on through life. And uh, we've been talking about this in our second Peter series, where Peter says, add to your faith moral excellence, or supply in your faith moral excellence. Uh, and to your moral excellence supply, what's the next one after that? Knowledge, and so forth. So, uh, we, the point I made uh, last Wednesday night is you're, when, you're, uh, when you become a Christian, when you're born again, you have all of these spiritual qualities in your life. But what we're called to do as Christians is to, is to grow in them, add to them, uh, increase them, increase our faith in these ways. And um, so I, I was, uh, Daryl was talking to me and he said, he says, that's just like, being born as a human being when you're born the everything's there your body you know, it's, you're just a baby maybe you can't walk yet but you've got two legs you got two arms you, you can't communicate yet but that's coming and so as we grow as a human we become more become more and more human as we grow up <laughs> that's the idea uh, and so you your mind develops your behavior and so forth. And so the same parallel is true in our spiritual life. And that's what, that's our, our walk with the Lord is by faith. So we start by faith, we develop by faith. So we're supplying into our faith all of these different things that God teaches us. All right, so the state of faith in the Christian life. All right, so I want, um, we used, we talked about these two words uh, in the Hebrew Old Testament for belief. All right, so believing is aman and trusting, batak. So believing, and by the way, the word amen comes from that word for believing. 
uh, amen means it is so. I, I, believe, I agree with it. I believe it, right? That's what it means. When we say amen, yes, that's true, right? We're, we're believing it. Okay. So, we had this chart about salvation. So, so, the beginning of salvation, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you rely on Him for salvation, you're delivered from sin, and the result is factual security. So you're, you're really, your sins are forgiven. The penalty of sin no longer um, uh, is, uh, attaches to you. Now, the second thing that we're talking about here in sanctification is uh, the idea of growing in this, but growing to trust God more and more. And that comes, from that comes assurance. So sometimes a new believer, he's going along in his Christian life, he's growing in various ways, but something happens. Maybe he uh, falls into some sin. How can I do this as a Christian? They have their conscience strikes them. How can I do this as a Christian? Or maybe, like everything else, after a while, the shine wears off. Things get a little, you know, you get into the humdrum of life. It was really exciting for a while. Now, okay, am I really a Christian? Boy, I just don't love the Word of God as much as I used to. Oh, it's becoming harder and harder. And Oh, am I really... And, and people are plagued sometimes with doubts. But what we're advocating for here is increasing our trust in what God says. Increasing our reliance. Because what that does is it gives us assurance. The more we trust what God says, the more assurance we have. And so, lack of assurance, Talbot says, comes from a failure to trust in the truth of the gospel despite belief in the facts of the gospel. A failure to trust. Oh, I have this on the screen. To, in the truth of the gospel, despite belief in the facts of the gospel. So we're calling for, for people to increase their trust. That's what this study is about in a nutshell. All right, so we want to car uh, carry on now today. That was the review. Oh, I should. Any questions so far? Anything that I've said? Yes, Jill? Well, the Holy Spirit is involved. Yes. Yes. Certainly that's true. We don't do anything without the Holy Spirit. However, we're called, one of the things that we've been emphasizing in the Second Peter uh, series, he says, uh, uh, giving all diligence, add or supply these things to your faith. So there is... Certainly, we, there is a dependence on the Holy Spirit, and certainly the Holy Spirit is witnessing in our hearts. That is another aspect of it, and that's actually a blessed aspect because, you know, our own efforts are feeble. Okay, that, we recognize that. But on the other hand, we're still called to, to uh, make some effort. There's a teaching out there, you may or may not be familiar with it. I don't know if you... Uh, you, uh, how many have heard the term Keswick theology? It's spelled K-E-S-W-I-C-K. Okay, a few of you. Okay, so uh, this there, there's a there's a it's sort of a movement within um, Christendom. There's it used to be more popular than it is today, but it basically and there's a lot of things that they teach that are, people who are adherents to Keswick theology. There are a lot of things they teach that are true. Uh, there is a sense when it comes to trusting God that we have to just give up trying to do it all by ourselves and just trust God. Okay? So Keswick theology will emphasize that. Now, where they go astray, they, they, um, they have a teaching that you can, you, if you will entirely consecrate yourself to God, you will, you will, you will, you'll gain sort of a spiritual victory and you'll be freed from your doubts by just, they, they have a phrase, let go and let God. So you just, you know, give it, well, uh, or breaking through, praying through. It's very similar. It's called, sometimes called the second blessing where you have entire consecration and now you're, you know, you're given, you're really given your heart to God. Okay, well, uh, one fellow pointed out that the people who teach this forget all the effort they put into understanding God's Word, to growing in grace, to, and so on and so forth. 
And it's really, I think, the biblical view is a both and. Now what they say, it is true, we have to rely on God. We have to just simply trust the Holy Spirit. That's true. But the Bible also calls us, you know, uh, as it said, applying all diligence. You know, uh, uh, cultivate uh, the fruit of the Spirit. So there is, there is a call for our participation in the process of growth. So it's sort of a both and. What we're emphasizing in this is what are we supposed to be doing when it comes to these things? All right? So I appreciate the question. All right, so what do we trust? All right. The foundation of trust. So I've got a big rock there. Okay? And the foundation of trust. And I have a statement. Our only ground for trusting God is what he says he is like and what he says we will do. In other words, God's character, which is holy, true, and pure. Everything God says, as we said earlier today, everything God says is true. So that at the bedrock of everything we believe is our God, okay, at the very bottom. So then from that comes revelation of God. In other words, his words. He says things to us. And so the revelation of God is, is next. The, underneath the revelation is the character of his words. Then from there we have belief in God. And then from there trust, confidence, or security in God. That is the uh, sort of the, uh, the development of, uh, of, of trust is what we're talking about here. What do we trust? Well, we, at the very bottom line, it is God. So I have this, another quote here from Talbert where he says, Trusting God is the fruit of believing God, and, is the only w and the only way to believe God is to believe his revelation what he says about himself and everything else. And the ultimate basis for believing and trusting God's words is his character, ultimate trustworthiness. And so that's why I have that big rock at the bottom of that, that slide. We're, we're, putting, we're relying on God. When we're saying trusting in God's words, we are relying on God because the only way we can do that is to know, the only way we can know anything about God is what God has said. All right? Uh, any questions on that one? at this point. All right, so let me uh, move on to then, I'm going to bring back this chart about salvation. And I want to, uh, I want to note a couple things. So for when you begin uh, in faith, in salvation, salvation gives real security for believers. Right, so you really, um, uh, even if you're weak and frail, even if you're forgetful, uh, you, you have, if you've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are born again. Okay? It's, and I've had people worried, tell me, well, how, you know, uh, what if I, you know, become, uh, uh, you know, have Alzheimer's? You know, what if I forget I'm a Christian? Well, <laughs> the answer is, God uh, takes you at your word. If you've called on the name of the Lord for your salvation, you are saved. So there's real security for believers. But the fact is, some believers have, uh, have few doubts about their salvation, but many have a struggle with their assurance. Okay? Uh, some will say anxiety, some will say about this, if you're worried, if you're anxious, then that's a sign you're not a believer. Okay, they will, anxiety, any anxiety is a proof of no salvation. Some will say this. But salvation doesn't depend on how a person feels. If you've believed in the Lord, you have real security. Factual security, as our chart says. Even if you struggle with assurance, even if you're plagued with ideas, well, oh, I'm just not sure I've, done this and I've done that, or maybe I'm not as zealous as I should be, so forth. Okay, those are the kinds of things. So, Talbert gives us an analogy here that I'd like to uh, help us with. Saving faith does involve trust. Sometimes, however, such faith can develop a hairline fracture between trusting the propositions of the gospel, that God can save, and this is how he does it, and trusting the personal effect of the gospel, that God really has saved me. Hairline fractures are slight, but they can still be intensely painful 
and debilitating. So he uses that as an illustration of there's, there's a sense in our spirits or we're, whatever reason, things have happened and we, we struggle uh, with uh, trust. Um, the struggle uh, ultimately comes down to the all too human tendency to doubt God's words even when you believe they are true. Uh, note here, salvation is God's work. He promised us to save all those who call. We must learn to trust him when he says that. And the ultimate object of trust is God himself. The immediate object of trust are the words God used to reveal himself. So that's, that's what we're emphasizing in all this. Okay, any, any questions? Uh, Rob? Yeah, that's interesting. I've almost heard it said the opposite way, that anxiety is God's work, but the fear of God is the salvation. No, that's what I would say to somebody. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've had people, they struggle and they're saying, well, I'm just not sure. And I said, well, why does it bother you? Okay, well... Because, yeah, I want to be saved. Well, and I, I, I recall, uh, how, if you've read, uh, in, how, how many have read anything by Jonathan Edwards? Anybody read any of his books? No, he has, he's written it, writing in the uh, 1700s, so it's really uh, older language. It's hard to read in some ways. But he has a book called The Surprising Work of God, in, uh, is the short title. It has to do with the revival in New England, The Great Awakening. And in there, he talks about people who would be, uh, and he's de- basically what he's doing in this book is he's defending the reality of the revival, the fact that people were really coming to Christ, and there was a great growth. There was some criticism of the people because there was so much emotionalism involved. Okay? And, well, it, emotions can get out of hand and people can be carried away in sort of a, a, a furor. That's true. But, He's defending that. But he talks about these people who are, they believe the truth of the, bo- of the gospel, the fact that they are sinners, that they need to be saved, that, that only Christ, Christ is their only salvation. And they agonize, agonize. Has he really saved me? Am I really, you know, like, it's, and, and it, it becomes, uh, it, it can become very debilitating spiritually. People can become very depressed. But the fact, why do you want to, why do you care? If you're not a believer, why would, it, why would you worry about it? Okay? And if, if you are worrying about it, it shows that it, you, you're trusting these words to be true. And he's done all the work. The Lord's done all the work. Just, you have to trust in him. You can't save yourself. So, you have to trust in him. And it's a hard thing for people to come to that notion, but that's what we're laboring towards with this. All right, uh, Marlene, did you have a question? Mm. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, you're calling God a liar when you don't believe his word, and that's a very, that's a good observation. All right, any other comments on this? Yes. That, that's right, yes, that's right. Yeah. So when we trust, uh, the, 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 um, how is it? the scriptures talk about our names being written in the book of life, the names of the believers being written in the book of life. So when you give your, you know, you hear the gospel, you respond in faith, you know, that, that's, I believe, God takes you at your word. And even you can't erase yourself. All right? Uh, so uh, you're, uh, so that, that's really important. Now, the thing is, that people do, but it can be very difficult for people wrestling with the idea of trust and faith. And so that's what we're still working on this. Now, I've got a couple of... Yes, Maureen. Yes. How, you know, so if somebody was wrestling with your salvation and trusting God's word, then you may make your own calling and election sure. Yes. You know, like, when people are plagued with doubts, like, is it because they have sin in their life and they're not turning away from sin? Or, you, you 
I, I think sometimes that is the case. Okay, sometimes the reason people have doubts is because they're sinning in their life and they, they aren't or they feel they can't turn away from it. Uh, that can be a reason. But sometimes it's just simply that they get shaken. Oh, uh, where it says, can I, can I be lost? They'll read, there are passages in Scripture that can somehow, can sometimes, if you take them in isolation, can shake you. There are some coming up in Hebrews that are like that. But one of the things that we have to do is to read the whole context. Most of the time, if you read the whole chapter, you will realize. So, I, for example, the very famous one in Hebrews 6 where he says, uh, those that have tasted cannot be renewed and so forth. I can't, I'm not quoting it quite right. All right. But in that context, he says, but I am convinced of better things of you. Okay, so he's, he says, He's describing the possibility of people falling away. He says, if somebody falls away, he is really in a bad place. But I'm convinced of something better of you. And so, so often in the context, the Word of God will give us the answer. But sometimes people, it's not just simply a matter of sin. It's just a matter of, boy, am I really? Because they want to be sure. And I think that desire to be sure is, in fact, evidence. Uh, that is the witness of the Holy Spirit itself, is what I believe. All right, so let's uh, move on here. We've got a lesson from Psalm 56. And, uh, that, well, we've got a good, bit more to go. <laughs> All right, so a lesson from Psalm 56. So the setting, David is in Gath. Okay, so 1 Samuel uh, uh, 21. And you know the story. Uh, David is fleeing from Saul, and he is... He is, um, uh, so he decides to go to Gath. He says, I might as well go and join the Philistines. Gath, remember, who was from Gath? Goliath. Okay, well, maybe they won't recognize me. <laughs> I'm not sure how, why you thought that. Okay, so the, th the servants of the king of Gath raised suspicion against David. And so David is worried, oh, maybe they're going to get me here. This might, I may have really made a bad mistake. And so, the king of Gath, so he, he, he pretends to be insane, okay? And so the king of Gath goes, Do I lack madmen that you have brought this one to act the madman in my presence? Shall this one come into my house? It's like, so he gets away by, by pretending to be insane. All right, so that's the setting. So Psalm 56, David is describing this experience. And notice the header on the psalm, a miktam of David when the Philistines seized him in Gath. So he's writing about this experience. Now, look what he says uh, about the object of his trust. So Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you, in God, whose word I praise. In God I have put my trust. I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? And then later on, verses 9 through 11. Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise. In the Lord, whose word I praise. In God, I have put my trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? And so here, this is that word, batak, trust. He blends trust, David blends trust with God's word. David knows God's word is trustworthy, so he trusts God's word. Okay? So there's, an, there's a lesson from Psalm 56. David's, David is emphasizing that it's his God's word. And by the way, what word did he have that sustained him in all those years of fleeing from Saul? Well, not just the law. He had something else. Samuel had come and anointed him and said, you're going to be the next king. God promised him that. Okay, he believed that. He relied on that. That kept him going. All right, Rob, were you going to add something there? Well, I was wondering if he maybe, uh, trying to remember if he knew that the Messiah would come from his lineage. Not at this point, I don't think. Not at this point, no. Right, right. Yeah, but, yeah. But in any case, uh, he, he, had, he had the word of God. Uh, in this particular case, and 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 then then so, but it's his word. God, he's relying on God's word. All right, so let's move on then to the opposite of trusting in God's word. So uh, there's just a couple of things here. Uh, you either trust God's word, or 
you trust something else. No one trusts nothing. Okay, so, uh, so Leighton Talbert says, the opposite of trusting God is trusting the wrong thing. Now, the Christian with a hairline fracture in his faith trusts God's words mostly. But there are doubts. The objective of this study is to reduce the doubts and increase trust. Okay, so potential objects of misplaced trust. So wealth. Okay, some people, they put a lot of trust in wealth. Uh, some people will trust in shady business practices. Uh, I met a guy one time. This is when I first was, I forget what I was doing. Uh, this is early in our years in Victoria here. And uh, I met him in some office somewhere, and he was talking to me about politics. And, I, and uh, anyway, but he told me the definition, he was a salesman or something, told me the definition of an entrepreneur. He said, an entrepreneur is somebody who will do almost anything to keep from having a real job. <laughs> Shady business practices, that's what I think of, right? Okay, so you have to be real careful about whether you're trusting in that. Okay, then there's your own righteousness. That's a misplaced... You, 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 your own righteousness isn't going to get you anywhere with God. The lies of false teachers. There's plenty of people trusting that. Um, influential people. Okay, they'll put their, their trust in some leader. Okay, they'll solve the problems for them. Political or military power is a... Is a wrong object, misplaced trust, okay? Uh, one's own strength, okay? Some people think they're just strong enough to handle anything that will come to them. One's own idols or ideas, okay? We're in love with our ideas. Uh, human wisdom or science. Some people, you know, trust the science. We've heard that a few times, haven't we? Right, and so on. Okay, a few of these objects of trust are evil in themselves. For example, shady business practices. But most are not. Any decision to trust anything other than God is a decision to mistrust God. Any decision to mistrust God's words is only a decision to trust someone else's words instead. So we're emphasizing here again and again, trusting God's words. Yes, Gord? Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And so, and that's a that's a real it's a faulty way of thinking. Gordon's talking about people he's known who who've trusted in emotions, and if they're feeling good and everything's going good, well, uh, you know, they're fine. But when when something happens. To shake them, and uh, then all of a sudden everything's doom and gloom, and maybe God isn't for me, and maybe I don't, you know, maybe I can't follow Him, or maybe I'm not following Him, and so forth. And that's that is that's really what we're trying to get at here. All right. So one last thing in this uh, today, uh, a picture of trusting God's words, and this is from Psalm 137. So David's counsel when confronted by the apparent success of evil men, it is don't fret. Don't fret. So, uh, in verse, verse 1, verse 7, and verse 8. And we might, maybe we should turn there just so we can read some of these verses. So, Psalm 37. I didn't put this on the screen because I... Uh, that's one limitation of the screen. You can't put everything up there. I, or I, I could, but it would be so small you couldn't read it. So, so, don't fret. So, verse 1. Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers. So that's verse 1. What was the other one? 7, I think he said. 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. Okay, and then verse 8. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It, only, it leads only to evil doing. Okay, don't fret. Remember the emotional aspect of trust. Trust is a stabilizing faith decision. If you're trusting in God's word, things might be terrible. You know, during the, the years of COVID uh, restrictions, it wasn't good for us. None of us liked it. Uh, well, nobody liked it. <laughs> uh, and, and it was, I've heard of some churches who have had and are still suffering from division, 
uh, lack of attendance, and so forth because of their experience during that time. I am so thankful to the Lord that our people stayed together, trusted God, that in the end it will come out right. right? And that's where we have to be. We have to just, just all right, things, things no doubt will get worse. As my dad had this saying, cheer up, it could be worse. So I cheered up, and sure enough, it got worse. <laughs> so, all right, so, Rob. Yes. Yeah, and I guess I would suggest that trusting the Lord isn't a, there's no, you shouldn't misplace your trust. He doesn't promise health to us. No, he doesn't promise us health, no. Well, and it's not a matter of, you can, if you believe hard enough, you won't be sick. Yeah, that's right. That's absolutely right. That's a good point. What I was saying, it, you know, if we just believe hard enough, we won't be sick. That's some people have that attitude. You know, the the health and wealth gospel is is that thing. You know, if you're if you don't have money, you must not be believing hard enough. Well, that's not how it works. That's really not how it works. You you just you have a life to live. Maybe God will bless you with money or health or whatever. Maybe He won't. I was amazed some years ago. Um, Oh boy, quite a while ago now. I was in a missions conference in Colorado, and and there uh, there were a bunch of missionary men who, with me, we were all staying in this missionary house that the church had. Okay, so it was a house on their property, and they there was about five bedrooms, and so they bunked us all in there, and our, we were all traveling without our wives on this occasion. And they they were telling me about things that had happened to them in their ministry. One guy was in New Zealand, another from Mexico, another I forget where the other guys were from. But I was, I thought, man, these guys have all experienced severe physical problems. Okay, like really, personally, and then in their kids and their wives and so forth, really severe problems. They had been missionaries serving the Lord for years and going through these kind of experiences. And I thought, oh man, maybe I must be doing something wrong. We don't have anything wrong with us. It was before Debbie's uh, thing with the leukemia. So now I'm in the club. No, I'm just... <laughs> but the thing is, you know, you just keep going. Because in the end, what we're doing, we're living this life for the Lord. And we tr- the trust, it's, it's in Him. And if he, if he allows us to live and serve Him, that's wonderful. If he, if he wants to take us home, He can do that right now. Okay? He can do it without the rapture. He can take you home right now if He wants to. So let's just trust Him. And and serve him as long as we can. Okay, go ahead, uh, Gordon. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The apostles all had those same experiences. Yes, uh, Joel. Yes. That's right. That's right. That's good. Okay, that's absolutely good. Okay, so so uh, uh, Tola, is that right, Tola? I say right. Okay, has given us an acronym for faith: forsaking all, I trust Him. And that's really that's really where we need to be. That's what we're working on with this study. Okay, forsaking all, I trust Him. So don't fret. Trust in the Lord is the next the next uh, point. So ver- verse three, he says, trust in the Lord and do good. Uh, and verse 5, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in Him, and He will do it. How do you do that? Verse 4, delighting in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord. Okay? Uh, verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. Uh, verse 7, rest in the Lord. Also, wait on the Lord. Wait patiently for Him. Uh, verse 8, cease from anger and forsake wrath. You just, you know... Make up your mind. This is the way it's going to be. You're not going to let yourself be swayed. Now, I put on the bottom of the screen here, positive faith attitudes. This comes from a beloved professor we had at uh, BJU back when we were in school. A wonderful man named Dr. Fremont. Now, he would talk, and he had this sort of nasal voice. And he had his glasses down on his nose. He'd go, you got to have a positive faith attitude, is what he'd say. Well, you know, he contracted Lou Gehrig's disease. He had, was debilitated. He was in a wheelchair. And usually, Lou Gehrig's disease 
is one where you don't last very long. You usually die fairly quickly. He suffered with that for years, for years, really. It was an unusual case. But he was always talking, even to the end, about positive faith attitudes. Leighton Talbot says the only way to trust God is by trusting in his words. And that's what we're trying to develop here in this, this study. So it's this reliance, this, this resting on the truth of God's word. All right, Debbie, do you want to add something? Yeah, just this illustration of that in his life, Dr. Sure. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yes, yes. His daughter was uh, in our Sunday school class in our church in uh, in Greenville, and she was killed in a car accident. And his response was was. Well, thank the Lord, there'll be somebody to meet, greet me from my family. He's a tremendous guy. Anyway, <clears throat> sorry. So trust the Lord. Let's, let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, we do thank you for this study. I pray that you'll help us as we continue thinking about trusting, thinking about, we're, we're going to be thinking about relying on you, and we're going to be thinking about how trustworthy you are. And so, Lord, I pray that you will help each one of us to have a full, complete trust in what God's Word says. We pray these things in Jesus' name.